All right. Welcome, everyone. My name is Heather Knoll, and I am the program coordinator at Sustainable Woodstock. Founded in 2009, Sustainable Woodstock is a not-for-profit community and environmental action and education organization. Our vision promotes vibrant, inclusive, thriving communities where we live sustainably now and in the future. And this event is a part of our Green Drinks series. Green Drinks are social events to connect people who have similar interests. We invite local nonprofits, businesses, and individuals to make a short presentation to share their sustainability and green initiatives in our area. And next month, we will have a presentation by the Vermont Community Geothermal Alliance on moving heat, geothermal, and thermal energy network solutions. And that'll be on December 7th. Uh, now, before we start with our presentation, I just want to run through the agenda and how the meeting will operate tonight. Um, as I mentioned before, we're being recorded. You all are currently muted, and if you have questions, please type them into the chat box on the side of your screen, and we will have time to answer questions at the end of the presentation. Now, I am very pleased to introduce you to our two speakers for this evening, Marie Levette Caduto and Courtney Buckley. Marie is the watershed planner for Southeastern Vermont with the Department of Environmental Conservation. Marie writes watershed plans that summarize water quality and habitat conditions in a watershed, identifies and prioritizes projects and actions needed to protect or restore water resources, and identifies appropriate funding sources to complete the work with partnering organizations. And Courtney is a fisheries biologist with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, who works closely with other biologists, agencies, and the public to protect and conserve fish and their habitats throughout southern Vermont. Welcome, Marie and Courtney. Thanks. All right, I will turn it over to you two. Great. All right, I'll pop this on and hope it works for a second time tonight. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, that's looking like you can see it. Looks great. Great. Well, for hi, as Heather said, I'm Marie Levette Caduto. And first of all, I want to thank Sustainable Woodstock for giving us the opportunity to talk about this. I was just saying that it's 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 a hot topic right now, and Courtney and I are getting asked this a lot. Um, how do we deal with these things? And I don't know, Courtney, if you want to just say hi before I dive into the slides. <laughs> yeah, uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here. I'll kind of jump in at the second part and uh, let Marie introduce you all to uh, river dynamics. And I will do that. Oh, there we go. So, you know, when we when we start talking about this particular topic, both Courtney and I work for the Agency of Natural Resources. And those of us who work with water resources, you know, our our goal is to work with with all sorts of habitats, we rivers, lakes, streams ponds, wetlands, to make sure that we have healthy ecosystems that support our uses and values, you know, how we want to use our waters, but also to support the, the everything else that depends on those aquatic systems. So as we go forward, we're always looking at how do we better manage those habitats and the physical features that support those habitats to make them fully functional and healthy for all those aquatic systems. So when we we start looking at that, when, whenever I start this conversation um, with people, my first question is usually, what does a river do? You know, you think about what what's a river? What does it do? What's its function? And for the most part, when we're talking about it, people say rivers move water. 
right? That's what they do. And I'm gonna say that's the wrong answer, right? Rivers don't move water. Rivers actually 24 seven, 365 days a year are moving a balance of water and sediment. And that sediment in July when the river's two inches deep might be a molecule of silt. And in July, it was boulders the size of your car, right? So, and, and that balance, that water picking up the sediment, picking up gravel, picking up cobble, picking up boulders is how the river spends its energy. And if the river doesn't spend its energy, we're usually in trouble. And when that balance gets thrown off, when there's way more water like there was in July, we have a problem. When we have too much sediment being dumped in, whether it's a collapsing bank or a really bad construction site, all those things, and we have too much sediment, that throws it out of balance as well. So that balance, you know, tips back and forth all the time. It's never static. That's why we call it dynamics, because the river is just, is never, ever static. And so we look at that river equilibrium, we're looking to find that balanced state where things, things are just going along. The banks aren't eroding. The, the sediment isn't being deposited in great clumps all over the place. So, so we're, we're trying to reach a natural balance with the sediment and the water load. And this is my absolute favorite slide to describe this because this was taken shortly after the flood of 1927. And this illustrates the fact that we have been messing around with our rivers for over a century, right? This was a long time ago when these things happened even before that. So when we when we step in and mess around with our rivers, these are the problems we end up with. So when they put in that railroad track, they cut off the end of this meander bend. They cut off this meander bend so much that they created a, a, an oxbow lake. They moved this meander bend, they filled it in and moved it over so that the farm field was bigger and easier to farm. Right. We've done all these things way before 1927. And so they took a river that had this nice meandering pattern. And if you think about a river meander bend, think about a ski slope or a switchback on a hiking trail. Same concept. You switch back and forth. You're making your, your trail longer and a lot less steep than if you're bombing down the slope. Rivers are the same way. The meander bends make the river longer, which means it holds more water in that channel and it's zigzagging back and forth. So the slope is less and it's moving slower. So what they did with this piece of river, straightened it out, lost all those meander bends, shorter, faster, I don't wanna be the house behind that historical society sign because you're gonna get hammered. That's what's coming at you is this fast flowing steep river. And this isn't the only thing we do to it. We straighten them all the time. We've created this problem because of things like confining the river and our highways, our roads do this all the time. We put in bridges and culverts that confine the river so it can't, it has to stay in that channel. We dig them out. We make these great big berms on the side so the water again can't get out, can't spread out and lose its speed. And then we do what that first one did. We redirect it. We move the rivers over. You know, we think we know where they should be. And we, we, we can never know where the river wants to be and where the river is gonna go. So all of these things, you know, we, we've created our own problems and our own issues with, with what we're facing on the landscape now, whenever we have one of these floods. And 
what we found with all the, the river assessment work that we do is, you know, a river goes through phases, we call it channel evolution, when it's when it it's in equilibrium in that first natural state, you have a river channel with a certain volume of water in it. And it mostly stays in the channel and every once in a while it comes out and it spreads out on the floodplain. When it does that, as I said, it loses its speed, it drops its sediment, it goes back slowly into the channel and runs off. We think that our time scale is similar to geological time scale. And if we haven't seen a field flood for 20 years, we figure, oh, that field doesn't flood. And of course it does. So we build on the floodplain, we put our houses next to the river because it's a fun place to be, and then get rather upset when the floodplain actually floods and does what it's supposed to do. So at that point, our reaction so far has been you put a berm up, you protect your house. So the, the field doesn't flood, your house doesn't flood. And when you do that, and you have that same amount of water that can no longer rise up, spread out, slow down, it's forced to hold that energy in the channel. And when it does that, the only thing it can do is dig down. So it steepens the channel, it makes it a lot deeper. And you see that all over the landscape with those banks that are just straight up and down and all eroding. And if you've ever dug a hole anywhere, you know that you dig deep enough and the sides are gonna collapse. And that's exactly what the next phase is, is that channel collapses and it widens out. So you've got the same amount of water, but now it's 50 feet wide and you know three inches deep instead of being a channel that's deeper, cooler, and supports fish. If we've watched rivers since Tropical Storm Irene, you'll notice that they've started to build a new channel. You know, they're not just all over the, that floodplain that they've created, but now they're starting to form a new channel. And that's what happens that over time, if we leave it alone, it'll find a new channel. The floodplain is now gonna be at a totally different elevation than it was. And what do you think we do? We start the cycle all over again. We put another house there because that field hasn't flooded for 20 years. And we set the whole process back to step one. What we've found with all the river assessment work that we do is that 75% of Vermont's rivers and streams are in one of these transition sections. So they're all going through some form of evolution. They're not stable and they're not in equilibrium. So in, as we go through what we're, you know, what we're about to talk about, I want you to keep this in mind that this is where we are with our rivers. <clears throat> and with debris, right? We, we see this on the landscape and we see it move in these massive storms and it seems like a big problem. And the first thing that, the, when I, I started to put the slides together and, and, and Courtney corrected me and said, this is not debris, <laughs> this is material, this is woody material. And, and that's how we, we now look at it because that woody material is so important. And it's, it's part of a natural cycle. It's part of the river and streams natural cycle. And it's part, it's a big part of the ecosystem health. So I'm gonna let Courtney take it away to, to get into all the really good specific stuff. Thanks, Murray. Um, tell me to hit the slide. Sure. Uh, yeah, so, you know, we talk about, and that's something we've called, uh, you know, woody material in the past. It's woody debris. There's, you know, mess in the river. Um, the issue with the term debris is that you think of, you know, trash and mess. And we're trying to move away from that in, you know, mess is really good. Uh, I like to say mess is best. I'll, as we go through this, I'll continue with some of our fish and wildlife taglines. Um, but what I wanted to point out here in uh, you know, the photo that Marie's already talked about of straightening this river is 
what you're missing in a lot of these stream banks is trees. A lot of uh, any of that woody material or large boulders um, throughout Vermont have been removed from those rivers as we make rivers into something that we're trying to control. Um, and then we like to farm around those. We do a lot of forestry practices in Vermont. Um, so we've cut down a lot of our streamside and upland trees. So they're no longer falling in naturally into those rivers. Um, so we, you don't really see a lot of this uh, woody material until we have a big event where there's so much power, like Marie was saying, that the river is actually able to then pick up these, you know, 30, 40 foot trees and carry them downstream. Um, so what we've been doing, uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife is, oh, can you go to the next slide, Marie? Um, we've been working on not only how do we keep woody material in the stream, but also in, in areas that have been cleared, straightened, how do we go and restore and actually put all of that material back? Um, help the river to jumpstart and get back to what it would naturally look like um, and kind of undo some of the damage we've done in the past. You know, that, that woody material as I continue through this, um, if we do have streams with trees along the side, we'll see the natural evolution um, that Marie talked about in river channel evolution happens naturally, whether or not we're manipulating it or not. The, the river is dynamic. It's always changing. It's always going to have small areas of erosion or deposition. That's how it makes new meanders. It continues to move. Um, but we've definitely exacerbated that that issue. Um, all of that wood, you know, plays a really vital role in how it influenced the morphology, but also the habitat, where the water is, and then like what kind of animals you see. So as a fisheries biologist, I'm gonna focus a little bit on that first. Can you hit the next slide? So what I have been trying to work on is how do I make, you know, fish more accessible to everyone? And I think in the last few years, we've seen uh, a lot about the real estate market in Vermont, a lot about, you know, people wanting to move here, but they're not being enough housing. So we like to say fish grow on trees. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about like, you know, what we need for high quality of life and how that compares to what fish need. So we need a house to begin with. We need somewhere that we can get out of the elements, um, that we can live, where we feel safe and are safe from predators, um, where there's ample food for us to be able to access and um, uh, where we're comfortable. So if you can hit the next view. You know, if you think about what shelter, what a house for fish looks like, um, it's not just the water. You know, they actually need somewhere where they can take a break, where they can get out of that high flow. I've had a lot of questions about what happens to the fish during these high flow events. Um, you know, they actually are utilizing those large boulders, those large trees, um, because they provide shelter from the fast flowing water. It actually slows the water down. Um, and gives them a place to rest. Uh, it also provides safety. So not only from anglers who are trying to catch them, because I know if any of you are anglers, how irritating it is to get your hook stuck in a, a log pile, but we all know that's where the fish are. Um, but also from predators, um, you know, it, it's a lot safer for them to be among the structure. All of the leaves and the branches, everything that's coming in off the hillside and, and the bark as the trees decay also then feeds all of the small invertebrates um, that are breaking all that down. And that's what fish are eating. So they're able to stay in this slow flow, wait for those invertebrates to uh, get you know pushed off of wherever they're shredding and um, they're ambush predators. So they'll come out, grab the little bug and then 
go back and, and take a break. Um, one of the number one things that trout need um, is cold water. Uh, and that's something that we focus on a lot for, for Vermont Fish and Wildlife is how do we keep our waters cold? Um, you know, it gets very, very hot in the summertime. I know uh, we all like to maybe get under the shade of a tree or an umbrella. We don't like to be out, you know, directly in the sun when it's 90 something degrees and fish are the same way. Um, and, you know, the water stays significantly colder when there's a pretty vegetated shady stream bank. Um, can hit the next one, please. So those those best fish houses are cold, like I said, they're complex, meaning that there's a lot of diversity in the type of structure that's there um, and connected. So this is a good photo that I came across um, from a video we have that shows not only a diversity in the type of sediments, so that goes back to that stream equilibrium, you have boulders, you have sands, you have gravels. Um, if you have a stream that is just collecting a ton of boulders, you're not gonna have that really diverse habitat that's going to um, accommodate all different types of fish and different sizes of fish. Um, you can see that these small brook trout are actually under a log. Uh, so when we got this video, we had to go into the water and then you know, kind of tuck underneath. Um, you know, that's where they're hiding, where they're relaxing. And you see all of the um, woody material on the back, you know, some people would be like, oh, well, that's a mess. We should clean it up, uh, you know, but that that is exactly what we're looking for and trying to keep things messy. Uh, could you hit the next one? So um, well, I was saying that the number one thing that fish need is cold water. Um, if there is cold water, the second next thing that is limiting their population is the amount of woody material in the stream. So in 2012, uh, one of our fisheries biologists and Trout Unlimited began taking some um, restoration techniques from out west that they were doing and adding that wood back into the stream. So here's a good example of what that looks like. Um, you have a fairly straight channel here and just a, a bunch of trees from the banks that were cut down and strategically placed in this area um, to provide that habitat. And, you know, part of, of being allowed to do that and the permitting is also then going out and checking how it's impacted the environment. So not only did we look at how many fish were in the area before and then did the work, went back and saw how it impacted fish, but we also look at um, how it impacts the way the channel is formed and if it's holding any sediment. Um, so in the last 10 years, since 2012, um, they have enhanced over 50 miles of stream. Um, and if you could hit the yeah next one, um, they saw that that almost tripled the amount of fish that were in the, the stream where this work was done. Um, and that 50 miles of enhancement equals 60,000 more brook trout um, every year. So that's not only in the area where the, the wood was added, um, it was also in the surrounding upstream and downstream reaches. Um, and that's important that it's not just attracting fish, but it's actually increasing the number of fish that the stream is able to support. Um, you know, it's the same as, you know, people are looking to move to Vermont. They're looking for houses. If there are houses, you're going to be able to support a larger population. Um, I, as I was saying, you know, this, this woody material not only provides really good habitat, um, but, and you can see the number of leaves and things that are collecting there, but it also helps to slow the river down and actually can hold back sediment. Um, the This photo on the left is actually uh, one of the strategic wood addition sites. And you can see just how much sediment, that fine sediment is gathering um, upstream. So as that tree hits the water, it slows the flow and that allows all that sediment as it slows to fall out of the water. So the same if you were swirling a, a you know a glass of water with sand in it, it would get suspended as it's moving really fast. But as it slows, you can see it kind of settle out. And 
what's really cool about the bottom right is being able to see that on the land um, where the crown of that tree and the uh, root wad were really slowing that down. You can see that in the area where they didn't have all of that um, root structure, water was moving much faster, carving out that middle chattel. And you see that um, with large boulders, with this type of um, material on really small scales and really large scales, um, which is really cool, just the way that water moves. And as as that happens, you know, sometimes the the sediment will build up completely um, to say at the top of that tree and creates almost like a waterfall. And when it does that, it also helps to raise that bed elevation, which allows the water to access over its floodplain. So if you have a really um, incised or really eroded bank and the water is stuck in that channel, by bringing up the bed it's able to then move up and over and that slows the water, keeps it higher um, in the watershed and can actually help with flooding downstream, help to hold that sediment higher up in elevation um, where it won't create as many issues for us. Um, you know, as it collects that sediment, it, it also helps with erosion. Um, but one of the major things that we're trying to focus on now, not only in adding wood to the stream, but is how do we jumpstart that process um, in stream and how do we plan for the future? And part of that is planting trees along stream banks, um, not only so that they will eventually fall into the river and help the in-stream, but also just the power of tree roots in how they hold banks together. Um, I'm, I don't know if any of you are gardeners, but it's way easier to dig in uh, your garden if you don't have a bunch of you know roots and things, and you can see just how much those roots hold onto sediment. And these are two photos that I took this summer um, on, on stream banks that if those trees weren't there, those banks would have you know, just been completely washed away. Um, they are really the like glue that is holding that stream bank together. And we do see that on, you know, um, open fields that don't have any tree, any buffer at all. They're so quick to erode away and you'll just get massive slumps um, of this material. And when that material enters the river, it's then picked up and carried downstream and, you know, then can create issues where you're getting too much sedimentation downstream. So they're they're really working well together to keep sediment where it, it should be um, and then slowly adding it to the stream. Um, and with that lower photo actually is uh, another point I wanna make about trees along streams is they not only are holding the bank together, but when the water does come up and over into that floodplain, it helps to also slow down the water and collect some of that debris. And then that all just adds to the nutrients that are there, um, you know, and, and the mess, which we like. Um, there are many instances, I think we've talked about, I've talked to a lot of people about this after the flooding is, you know, what do we do? A tree came down in the river or, you know, we have all of the these logs, this log jam that's now in the river. What do we do about it? And people are a lot like beavers. We like to do something. We like to start getting in there and engineering and figuring out how we can fix things. But really the best thing you can do is just to, you know, it naturally dropped there. There's a reason why the wood landed there. So in the photos on the left, you can see those meander bends. That's where all of that flow is really slowing down and it, it'll it naturally collect and land there. Um, you know, it might be unsightly, but it's really important not only to fish for that uh, structure, um, but also birds, other wildlife use that structure in the same way. Um, if it's not impacting any infrastructure, um, there's really no reason why it needs to be cleaned up. Um, the photos on the right are from a, a, a tree that came down in the Batten Kill this year and that I got lots of phone calls about because paddlers wanted to get around it. 
And um, I think that first photo was taken in July and maybe the second one was taken in September. And it just shows that the force of the water is gonna do that work for you. You know, there's there's no need to go in, spend the energy in taking that tree out or pulling it out or, or chopping it up. Let the river do what it's going to do. And it naturally pushed it to the side. Um, and now they have a new fishing spot. Um, you know, we all like that is ideal. Uh, that's exactly what we want to see. Um, and there are instances where we can't let the river just do what it wants. Um, and I think a lot of the work we're doing, Marie and I, is how do we work with um, towns, private citizens, uh, and the state um, in identifying where, you know, we actually have to go and change something. So a lot of the culverts, bridges, and failures that we saw not only were um, because of the high flow, but because of the size of those structures. So they're not big enough to accommodate the water that's flowing through them. It's being asked to take this amount of water and putting it through a straw. But then what happens is if you have woody material that comes up against that and it is as big as the river, it will not be able to pass through that structure. And when it builds up, it actually will put pressure, which causes um, these culverts to blow out. So when we get calls or we talk to people about, you know, there's a tree in the river, or, you know, I'm concerned about this. We often will look at, are there areas where that wood is going to settle out? Are there meander bends that are gonna capture it before it hits the infrastructure? Um, is there a way, you know, that we can maybe not get rid of the whole thing or it you know may need to come out so how do we balance where we are where we need to move on the landscape and how do we not just one size fits all treat um any of these you know large material so in the one uh photo with the culvert you can see how small it is compared to how wide the stream is and the size of those trees. Um, this is actually downstream. So those trees aren't threatening uh, that culvert. Um, so I wouldn't think that they would need to move those, but if those were upstream, they could threaten the culvert. And you know, we, we do not want that just in the amount of manpower time, um, you know, and risk to public safety that that could have. So, you know, that would be somewhere where I would recommend that we take those trees out. Um, but for the most part, you know, leaving things where they are, where they fall is where they want to be. Um, in the areas where we do need to want to reestablish that equilibrium, improve habitat, kind of go back and fix things that, you know, created the issues in the first place, um, we have a lot of different ways that we can go in about doing that. So one of the ways is using these log vein root wads um, and some of this burlap um, shoreline stabilization that helps to keep that bank from eroding if it doesn't have trees or any of that natural structure to keep the bank from eroding. Um, we also can do in-stream work with large boulders and create these rock strainers, these weirs. Um, those help to slow down um, the water and build up the stream bed. It helps to then access the floodplain and slow the, the water on the landscape even more. Um, as I spoke about earlier, we do a lot of strategic wood addition. Um, uh, we'll say that we call it strategic wood addition because we're not just going and cutting any tree and putting it in the water. That's not really something we want to encourage people to do for all of the you know reasons I said with them, you know, possibly moving, creating issues downstream. We don't really do that type of work um, within 500 feet um, to a thousand feet of any sort of infrastructure downstream. That includes, you know, houses and things like that where it could, you know, end up on a private property. Um, and you want to do it correctly um, so that you're doing it right the first time it's hitting the water. It's not at an angle that then is going to make the river do the work. Um, and the last 
one is um, setting up places where all the sediment that is getting moved by the water can naturally settle out um, in a place where it will be le least impactful to us and also help the river and not then create issues downstream. Um, so there's a lot of considerations that go into all of these types of restoration um, and all has to go towards a specific question or fix that you're doing. There's no one size fits all um, and you have to be very site specific. So part of like, those are the ways that we go and do things actively. There's a lot that we can do that you can do passively to also help rivers um, and the fish and wildlife that uh, inhabit them. So keeping your stream bank or any stream bank vegetated and undisturbed, that means like no mowing, no cutting of trees, um, ideally planting those, you know, the, the river from the photo that Marie showed earlier of just how strained and how wide that is, you, you want to have most of that to be naturalized so that when the river does move over there, it's not impacting anything. That is very unlikely in Vermont, but what we're trying to do is identify places where we can keep things in their natural condition, where we can um, plant trees to then shade the water, to keep the banks stable, to absorb any runoff of pollutants or sediment um, that's coming off the hillside or even from upstream, um, like those trees up against the, the uh, standing trees, you know, where can that be held back naturally? Um, and in the cases where we can't leave things, um, consider, you know, doing sort of more of that restoration. Um, if, if there's an area that is, you know, very flat, doesn't really have any complexity, um, doesn't have any trees along it, that, that would be a really high priority for, for me at least, to try to get that to be a little bit messier, get more wood in there, um, you know, not just for fish, but for all the other reasons, you know, we talked about. So I guess with that, does anyone have any questions? Marie, do you have anything to add? No, not really. You covered it. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say that we do have, you know, we, we, we keep a list of the projects that we want to do. Um, the thing we need is people willing to do them. We, we have lists of projects and majority of them are on private lands, you know, and, and if, if you are willing, you're, a, you know, a riverside landowner, a stream or a lake, um, and you're willing to do some of this enhancement work for habitat, water quality, for flood control and flood resiliency, we want to hear from you because we're, we've got lots of things that we can do in lots of different places. Great. So there were a few people who joined uh, after uh, we went through our agenda. So I just want to let everyone know we're taking questions in the chat. And if you're not familiar with Zoom, you can run your cursor over your screen um, and see the, the more uh, button at the bottom and click on that and the chat will pop up once you click on chat on the side and you can type your questions into the screen there. And looks like we've got some questions here. So um, I'm curious how you respond to people who say wood in streams and rivers will cause natural dams and more flooding. Um, yeah, I can, I can take that. Um, you know, it, it does slow the water and does act like a dam the same way that like beavers builds dams. Um, we have found that fish are able to navigate through those. So they're definitely not dams to aquatic um, organisms. And they tend to be a lot 
um, shorter lived than say, you know, a, a concrete dam. So they may hold um, sediment back. They may help the water flow over them, but they last a lot shorter uh, lifespan um, than something bigger. So yeah, they're they're mostly temporary. You know, they're always going to degrade. They're going to move downstream. They're going to break down over time, um, which is also why we need more trees uh, along the stream to replace those. Great. We have a question: Does this apply to smaller brooks without any fish, or are there other considerations for brooks? Um. I would question whether or not there's actually no fish in that brook and how small it is. Um, I'm always really surprised by just how small of a stream and like roadside I will find brook trout. Um, they really are ab almost about everywhere where you've got cold water and not a huge waterfall downstream. And if there is a big waterfall, but enough water upstream that they you know, were able to establish up there, then they still might be there. A lot of that wood addition that we talked about, that I talked about, um, is actually mostly done on small streams. So streams under 40 feet wide. Um, that's because you need the tree to be at least twice the height um, as the stream is wide. Otherwise, it's going to get washed out pretty easily. Um, when we do this type of wood addition in larger streams, it's usually with larger machinery where you actually have things tied down. Um, and if I can, and I'll add, you know, we do this, we, we add wood or we keep wood for, for habitat purposes, but it's also incredibly important for that stream structure. Um, and as we've talked about, you know, holding back sediment and the higher up in the watershed where the streams are smaller, um, that's really key because we want to keep as much water up in the headwaters as possible because as it accumulates coming down and then, you know, hits the larger streams and rivers that run through our villages, that's that's where all the flooding issues happen. So the more water we keep uphill, the more of it we can slow down, keep the sediment up there. And what it does as it accesses the floodplain is a lot of that water will get infiltrated into the ground. So it's not in the stream when it hits the village. So all of those other functions of flood resiliency of geomorphology and, and functioning of that stream channel are just as important in the smaller streams as, as they are in the larger ones. Great, we have another question. Uh, given that bends in streams can take the most impact from heavy storms, but straight sections of streams can flow faster, which is the most important to armor? We, none of them. <laughs> so we use hard armoring, riprap, the big boulders that, that get placed on stream banks as little as possible. Um, and only where it's essential to protect infrastructure. The, the impact of those sections of hard armoring, you know, we look at them, we put them in and we think that's fixed and that's a that's a per permanent fix, but it's not. You know, there's an end on each side that is going to, con that's hitting natural flows. And when you hard armor that, what you're doing is protecting one section and negatively impacting another one upstream or downstream at the ends of those riprap sections. You can think of it as a pool table. You know, you, you angle the ball off that hard armor and it deflects and it goes and it erodes someplace else. And it carries that energy, that, that fast energy with it. When the banks are natural and there's trees, there's, there's roughness along those banks, that again slows the water down. So anywhere we have hard armoring, 
we know that we have to watch out up and down for the next place it's going to erode. Um, so we, anyone who puts hard armoring in a stream needs a permit for that. Um, you can't just go and dump it in there because they have to look at what, what the impacts are gonna be from that hard armored section. So we try to do it as little as possible. That's great. There's also a follow-up for that. Um, the person says that they meant uh, armoring with trees, not hard armoring. Ah. I would say that they're all important. So on a straight stretch, um, particularly, you know, on wider streams where the sun can impact the temperature of the water. You want as many trees as possible to provide that shade and keep the water cool. On, on those meander bends, what happens is on the outside of a meander bend, it's always going to erode. And on the inside of a bend, the sediment is always gonna drop because that's gonna be slower. So, you know, when you think about planting something, though the outside of those meander bends are really key. Um, as the sediment deposits, things will pretty much naturally start to grow up, but it's it's always good to plant anywhere that there are no trees because that shading, that debris, all of those pieces falling in are really important. And Courtney, you might want to add to that. Yeah, um, I, I would add that um, typically what happens when you do drop this type of wood or wood lands uh, in a straight section is it creates a meander. Um, you know, it, it basically, the tree is then acting like the inside of the meander bend and it will start to erode around it. So, you know, it's also good then because it then lengthens the stream and creates more of that complexity. Um, you know, as, as things erode and deposit, they will be different size um, sediments which is also good to support multiple years of fish. Um, I see another uh, question. Um, if uh, the tree starts to fall and it's leaning over the stream, is it best to encourage it to fall um, with the root ball hanging on uh, the back of the brook? Uh, I would say, that you don't need to encourage or discourage anything um, that, you know, it's it's either going to fall imminently or it's going to fall in the next few years. Um, but you definitely don't need to encourage it because it, it will then erode um, behind the root ball and it'll start to, you know, create more of a meander there. Um, so you kind of just let it do do its thing. We definitely don't want, um, you know, there's, and then there's no reason to go and start, you know, pushing trees in and say, oh, this one, this one's going to fall in. Why don't we just take care of it now? Um, you know, it's, it's still, the roots are still holding the bank together. Um, it's still providing, uh, you know, as a living tree, those leaves and, and branches. Um, so it's doing its job on the stream bank until uh, it, you know, gets a promotion. Great, we have another question. What should be planted on stream banks? Is there a particular tree or bush that works better? I'll take that one. Sure. Um, for trees, usually the best thing to do is look at what's already there, because that's what's gonna grow in your soils. Um, if there aren't any trees or shrubs, the, the first things we generally plant where there are no, where there is no riparian vegetation are things like willows, dogwoods, shrubs, because you can plant those really quickly um, and they'll root really fast and spread those fine roots and start holding the soil together right away. And the good thing about being able to plant them right on a stream bank or a river bank is that if they get sheared off by the next ice out, they just come back. So they're they're there all the time and they start that process of erosion control and shading. And then, because it takes trees obviously longer to grow 
and to get to a size where they're going to make a real difference on the stream bank. So when you plant those fast growing, fast sprouting shrubs, you get a jump start on it. And then a little farther back, you can plant whatever type of tree is surrounding you. Maples are good. Um, pines, not so much. <laughs> they, they don't do the best job. Um, but they, if they're around your stream, then obviously they will grow there. Um, there are specific species that do well when in, in areas that, that are going to be wet a lot. Sycamores are good for that. Um, red maples are good for that. Go for it, Courtney. Throw in some others that... <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that um, both DEC and Vermont Fish and Wildlife both have riparian planting guidances that have lists of trees um, and shrubs that are native um, that do well in riparian, so low-lying, wetter soils. But yeah, Thanks. willows, dogwoods, um, you know, alders, they're all good. All right, anyone have any other questions? Well, um, I just wanna say thank you so much to Courtney and Marie for sharing with us. Um, really a lot of great information, maybe we can get those riparian planting guides to send out to everyone uh, as a follow-up. That would be great. And for any of you who missed our intro, we have our next green drinks coming up on December 7th. It will be with the Vermont Community Geothermal Alliance on moving heat, geothermal, and thermal energy network solutions. Hope you all can join us for that. And... Looks like, uh, yep, no other questions. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Have a good night.